So I'm going to jump right into the word because I recognize that, you know, you took a step of faith to come out today and we want to just keep, keep our minds focused on the Lord because you could have stayed home. You could have just watched on, on the live stream, but you decided to take a step of faith and I bless that. I bless you for that. We were going to do it either way, right? Because we want to worship and we don't want restrictions on the worship, but, but you took a step of faith and you came out and that multiplies the impact on the kingdom of darkness. Because when we are magnifying the Lord together, there's an amplification that happens. And we've been denied that ability for the last eight months. You know, today is the eight month anniversary to the day. It was Sunday, March 15th was the last service that we had at our old church before the restrictions hit. And I'm not gonna say happy anniversary. But I am going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servants. Because you continued, you fought the good fight, and you continue to fight the good fight. And we are going to do that too. We only have one more payment left on all the construction that was done, and we're done. It's amazing. The Lord has so blessed us for the generosity of our people, and, and the same with the relationship with the people here that, that, own the, uh, that run the property here on the deaconry. It's been a great relationship with them. So we know we're here for a purpose. I hope you know that you're here for a purpose. And I would just like to give you the, the title that I hope you remember today. Say this with me, all right? God is greater, God is greater. than our hearts. Yeah. One more time. God is greater, God is greater. than our hearts. Yeah. And that's taken from, first, I'm sorry, yeah, 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. That's exactly what it says. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts. All right? And I just really feel like based on the atmosphere, the spiritual atmosphere that we've all been in recently, especially as Trisha was saying, just how contentious things have been, that we as Christians, we have to stand in, in the middle of that and keep our eyes focused on the Lord. And we have to treat people with respect. And we have to be honorable. Even if we disagree, we can do it in a way that shows respect to that other person. Amen. So what's the part about our hearts condemning us? If our heart condemns us, we know that God is greater than our hearts. Last week, I talked about that my faith was not going to fail. Anybody remember this from last week? Yes. My faith will not fail. Yes. And it was all about Jesus speaking to Peter. I'll just give you a quick overview because I'm going to do like a part two here today. You remember, Peter was all full of energy. He was very enthusiastic. He really did clearly love the Lord. And Jesus said, I'm not going to be with you much longer. And where I'm going, you cannot come with me. Remember this? Yes. And Peter said, no, Lord, I will go with you wherever. I will go even unto death for you. And what did Jesus say? Sorry. No, you won't. In fact, before the alarm clock, rooster, goes off in the morning, you will have denied me three times. Remember last week in Luke chapter 22 is the only place in the Gospels where it, it describes the scene of what happens. Peter denies Jesus for the third time. And then Jesus makes eye contact with Peter because they were sitting close enough to where Jesus could hear the denial. Anybody remember this from last week? Yeah. And my point was, if you grew up thinking that God is an angry judge, then you would think that the look that Jesus would have had on his face that day would have been shaming. and would have, Jesus would have been angry at Peter. See you, you lowlife, you denied me, just like I said you would. But I feel like the Lord showed me it was a very different scene. I think that when the Lord looked at Peter, he said, it's okay. Remember what I told you, Peter. I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. So even though you deny me against what you said you would do, I'm still praying for you. And when you return, strengthen your brothers. That's the, that's the word for us right now. And let's just be honest, okay? It's been eight months since covid first started and the restrictions, I can remember actually in February in our pastoral care meeting saying that the state could stop us from meeting. And that was the first time the people at the table had thought about that and said, wow, we've never been in a situation in our country where we would not be allowed to meet for church. And it sounds a little scary, doesn't it? Because of the Constitution and, our, and the amendments and, and our right to free speech and the right to gather. And we want to cooperate. We want to go along with what the laws are. We don't want anyone to die because we're, we're being reckless. But eight months is a really long time, isn't it? And I'm pretty much guessing we didn't think it was going to be this bad for eight months. 
when we first heard it in March, right? And then again, if I look in the rearview mirror and I look at the last eight months, I cannot give myself an A-plus on every situation I've been in over the course of that eight months. How about you? <laughs> Let's be honest. We're in church. Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. How many times have you got out of your car to go in the store and forgot you left the mask in the car? <laughs> Repent for what you said about that mask. <laughs> we got to cleanse our hearts. We have bitter root judgments against the mask. And I'm, I got it right here. So Try to be legal. But it goes beyond that, too, because many times when you're under stress and you don't understand the situation, you're... Your spirit, man, just like when the, when the apostles were in the garden, right? And Jesus said, tarry with me for an hour. And they fell asleep, right? And, and what did he say? Your spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So I'm just guessing now, just in general terms, that over the last eight months, when you wanted to have faith, just like Peter, he wanted to have faith and say, I'll go with you. I'll even give my life for you. And Jesus said, no, but that's okay. I'm praying that your faith won't fail, that even for us, we might have been disappointed in the way we behaved at, at some point in the last eight months. Is that safe to say? Yeah. And the concept that we talk about here is counterfeit affections. So instead of what, what our ideal would be, was, would be to go to the Lord and get the answer to the prayer, is that we go to food, or we go to television, or we binge watch shows on, on Netflix, and and whatever it is, it's less than the highest standard, baby. So we have to learn how to forgive ourselves, don't we? Yeah. Because that's one of the hardest things that we can do is to actually cut ourselves some slack. Because we tend to focus on the negative more than we do on the positive. That's our human nature. But that's not how God wants us to think about ourselves. Amen? He doesn't want you saying anything about yourself that he would not say about you. So don't call yourself a loser. Don't repeat word curses that have been spoken over you in the past by coaches or even your parents or, or somebody in influence over your life that spoke word curses over you. Can we just do this right now? I break any word curses that have been spoken over me. I am the accepted and the beloved. I am a child of the living God. I'm not perfect, but I serve a perfect God. And my aspiration is to be formed in his image with ever-increasing glory. See, that's the goal. We're not saying that when we go to those counterfeit affections that that's a necessarily a good thing. I'm not excusing it. But I'm asking you to forgive yourself for it. Because you can't be at your full strength as a Christian if you're living in shame. Okay? So say this with me. Shame off. You know how sometimes we'll say shame on you for doing something? Don't say that. We're not trying to put shame on people. We want to sick the Holy Spirit and he'll bring conviction. That's very different than condemnation and shame. All right? So can you give me a couple minutes for some scripture? I hope you say yes. <laughs> all right. First of all, let's think about eight. What's the number eight mean in the Bible? New beginning. So that's one way to think about it. We've been through eight months of this. We don't know how long it's going to last. But we should have enough strength of spirit to say, however long it lasts, I'm going to see a victory. Right? And what we were just singing, I'm going to see a victory. God takes what the enemy meant for evil and he turns it around for good. And even if I haven't been the one struggling with my own behavior, I'm sure if you look in your contact list and your phone, somebody in there has been struggling with something. Losing a loved one. Not being able to see somebody they love die in the hospital because they were restricted from going to the hospital. Not being able to have a funeral, a memorial service. These are brutally hard things. We've never had to deal with that before. There's an important aspect to life to bring closure when somebody you love dies. And if you didn't get to do that, that's going to leave a hurting heart. So look, as, as a church for 20 plus years now, we've been known as an outpost for hurting people to come and get ministry. Right? So if ever this church should be attracting people, it's now because there's a lot of hurting people. And we're not shaming anybody about it. But you're a part. You're an extension of our church. So think about it this way. Right? That we've been blessed to, to be a blessing to other people. Sometimes just listening and letting them cry on your shoulder is a very spiritual thing. 
You're just allowing them to vent and allowing them to grieve. Okay, so eight, I'm going to say, is new beginnings. And no matter what happens going forward, I truly believe life will return to normal at some point. All right? Anybody disagree with me on that? There's going to be a day you're not going to have to wear a mask to go into a store. And I'm focused on that. I got my eye on that prize. I am so sick of walking back to my car after I've been halfway to the door of the place I'm going. And it's like, oh, and I see somebody walking out with the mask on, and that reminds me. It's like, oh, man, I think this part of me just doesn't want to agree with this whole thing. <laughs> but I will cooperate with it. So Romans 12.1, a lot of you probably know it already. I'm just going to focus on be renewed, right? Transform your mind. you got to be renewed. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the more you can stay in the Word, the more you can listen to worship music, the more you can avoid all the news, right? Like you, know, you could read in, in 10 minutes in the morning a summary of what happened, or you could spend five hours listening to all the stuff and exchanging uh, posts on Facebook with people and debating them. It's not a productive use of your time. You've got to know what you stand for and walk by it. And right now, if I just, you know, could summarize at the election, the word I would say is evidence. That's all you have to say. We don't know what's going to happen. If there's no evidence, then nothing's going to change. If there's evidence, they got to show it, and that's it. That's as far as you got to go. You don't have to have a million opinions about it, but pray, please, pray for the country. Because the devil knows that a house divided cannot stand. And we should be praying for unity. And I love what Trisha said, that, that we have to respect other people, regardless of whether they agree or disagree with us. And then 2 Corinthians says this, Thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Say it with me, all right? Thanks be to God, who always, again, who always leads me to triumph in Christ. Man, remember that one. That's 2 Corinthians 2.14. But then it says, and through us, he spreads and makes evident everywhere the sweet fragrance of the knowledge of him. So let's just repent for a minute. If there's anything we've done in the last eight months that wasn't a sweet fragrance. I used to live on a pig farm. That was not a sweet fragrance when the wind blew the wrong way. So Lord, we ask you to forgive us. If anything that we did was not a sweet fragrance, and look, you might have to go to some people and say, you know what, I'm sorry, I, I realized what I said, I was a, a little overheated, and please forgive me if I offended you in, in what I said to you in that exchange. That could be one of the most godly things that you ever do, because the people in the world aren't used to seeing that, are they? People in the world are used to seeing people dig in deeper when they're fighting against you. But when you can go and say, you know, I was reflecting on what happened, and I, that's not who I want to be. The person who hits send on that is not the person I want to be. Would you forgive me? And they're not used to that. But that's big Christian witness. Obviously, you have to mean it and be authentic when you say it. All right, so a couple things. I didn't know this until recently. I was listening to a podcast, and the psychologist that was on it talks about post-traumatic stress disorder, and, you know, I don't want to compare what we're going through with what happened to Vietnam, or if, if I, I've, I've counseled people who were in Vietnam and had the, the, the stress of having witnessed people dying in battle, and some of the things they, they even had to do, they were so disappointed in themselves because of the way they acted, right, and, and that just haunts people. So it's not to that extreme, but this has been a stressful eight months. So you need to cut yourself a little slack. And that's why I focused on the scripture from 1 John 3, 20. It says, even when our heart condemns us, we have to remember that God is greater than our hearts. Amen. Right? So it's, it's in order to be able to look in the mirror and say, I can't believe you failed that test. Don't say that. Say, you are a child of God. You are filled with his spirit. You have the word of God as your foundation. And you are going to... Uh, shift your behavior. You're going to repent. You're going to change the way you think about certain things so that that won't be the result the next time. And I've done this. Look in the mirror and say, I forgive you to yourself. Amen. There's a cleansing that happens. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from iniquity. Amen? Amen. So um, one more verse from Corinthians before I go to the Gospels. 
I love this. I actually preached a sermon with this as the title once. But I'll give you the whole verse. 2 Corinthians 12, 10 says, When I feel my weakness, all right? Has anybody felt any weakness over the last eight months? All right, thank you for being honest. It's not a bad confession. It's just being honest, right? Like, it's been a rough ride. A lot of, a lot of hard things to try to digest. So when I feel that weakness, instead of shaming myself, I say, when I'm surrounded, this is again 2 Corinthians 12, 10, when I'm surrounded with troubles on every side and I face persecution because of my love for Christ, I am made yet stronger. Sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? But he goes on to say, for my weakness becomes a portal for God's power. So in that moment when you're feeling like you don't know what to do, you open yourself up to the Lord and allow him to come in and fill you with his presence. So even there, he can make an opportunity. We don't do it in our own strength. But in my weakness, his strength is perfected. That's the same verse. But this is the Passion Translation. It says, in my weakness, I have an opening to be a portal for God's power to flow through my life. Where people could look and say, that couldn't have been you. That was a supernatural response that you gave. All right. So John chapter 13, if you want to turn there. I'm going to just only speak for a little, little bit more time. And I think I can make the point I want to get. Because remember now, Peter could have been so condemned when Jesus looked across after that third denial that Peter could have done what Judas did and go kill himself. There's a part of us that just gets so shamed and so disappointed that we don't want life to go on. And instead of that, Peter hung in there and he remembered what Jesus said. When you return, strengthen your brothers. I'm going to pray for you, Peter. Even though you're going to fail me, I'm going to pray for you that your faith would not fail. And when you return, strengthen your brothers. These are all your brothers and sisters around you right here. So I know there's people here today that need prayer. All right? So we're going to stay and we'll pray. We just want to honor the rules, right? We can pray verbally. If, uh, you know, if, if it's a sensitive subject, you're not going to want to say too much out loud. But, but there's plenty of room here. We can find a place to pray where you can share what's going on in your heart. And just a, a, a revival of joy to be in your life. A revival of hope to be in your life. Uh, an ability to block out all the noise that's going on out there and say, no, I'm anchored to the rock of Jesus. Yeah. So now, we talked about Luke chapter 22 last week. That's when Jesus actually looked across and, said, and, and, and made eye contact with Peter right at the moment he was failing. I don't believe it was a shaming look. I believe it was the look of, I pray, I'm praying for you, Peter. I got your back. You're one of my guys. I got your back. Don't quit. And then John chapter 13, it's the same scene. In verse 36, Peter says, Lord, where are you going? Jesus, Peter, you can't come with me now, but later you'll join me. Peter, why can't I go now? I'll give my life for you. Jesus, I tell you the truth. You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And the very next verse says this. Don't get lost in despair. Believe in God and keep on believing in me. Who would he be talking to? He was talking to Peter, in my opinion. You know why we don't always think he's talking to Peter? It's because it's chapter 14, verse 1. You ever, ever think about how we do that? That's not how the story was told when it was told. When it was being written down, it was one continuous thing. But if, if you just look at John chapter 14, verse 1, it says, let not your heart be troubled, right? And that's a great word, isn't it? Yeah. But it's even a greater word if, if it's a continuum from the prior verse where it ended. It was right speaking to Peter in a moment when he felt like he failed the Lord. And that's what I want to say to you today prophetically. Put it on the table right now. If you feel like you failed the Lord, if you feel like you've been less than a great example for the kingdom, we need to shake that off because we're not going to be operating at full steam at the full effect of this, that the world needs us to be. I'm going to say that right now. The world needs the church to stand in the gap of the pain of all that's going on right now. I'm not saying you shouldn't have feelings, of course, but you bring them to the Lord. You bring them to other people that you know and love. We're doing Zoom calls, right? We could still do counseling calls on Zoom, and we like to call it prayer ministry. We don't want to say counseling because there's no charge for any of this. We're, we're biblical Ministers is really what we do. But that's what you need sometimes, right? That's what you need. That other believer who's full of faith, 
that can help you through that struggle that you're going through. Many of the times it's just letting the person talk and just being there to listen and pray with them as opposed to trying to come up with the solution right on the spot. All right, and then in verse 7 he says, If you know me, you know the Father. I'm in Luke 14, 7. If you know me, you know the Father. Yeah, John 14. And I love this. Rest assured, you know the Father and you have seen him. So who was he talking about? Himself. <laughs> this is John 14, verse 7. He says, if you know me, you know the Father. Right. How many know Jesus here? Amen. Well, then you know the Father. Amen. All right? And that's what he was saying in response to Philip. Lord, if you would just show us the Father. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, and then I, that allows me to rest assured that, that I know the Father and I've seen him because I've seen him through Jesus. Verse 12. John 14, I tell you the truth, whoever believes in me will be able to do what I have done, but they will do even greater things. How many believe that? Amen. You can do greater things than Jesus. Okay. I, I'm, I'm happy you're putting your hands up, but that could feel like a pretty big challenge, can't it? Because he did some pretty amazing things. But he says on the next word is because. The reason that we can do greater things is because I will return to the Father and I will ask the Father to send you another helper. Yeah. Who's that? The Holy Spirit. Wow. God opened up the vault of heaven and released the Holy Spirit onto all flesh. That's what it says in the last days. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Now look, this could be controversial maybe in your mind, but what does all flesh mean? All Christians or all humans? So that means when you witness to somebody, you can identify with the part of the Spirit that, that's been poured out on them, but they're just not aware of yet. You can remember when you were getting witnessed too, right? There was that strange, I think it was uh, Wesley, one of the Wesley brothers said, I felt this strange warmth on the inside of myself. You know, like he felt the Holy Spirit's presence coming in to convict him. So we should be encouraged by this, right? Because we're all made in his image. And by Jesus coming out of that tomb, resurrecting from the dead, that allowed the Spirit of God to be poured out into all the earth. So we, corporately, as a group, the church, can do greater things than Jesus did when he was here. And I would be as bold to say we have done greater things because there's billions of people on the planet that know the Lord right now. And when he was here, he was limited to his geography, where he was. But we have to be obedient to the call and how many know that many of the times when he asks you to do something, it looks impossible, right? You can relate to Peter when Jesus said, step out of the boat and walk on the water. It's like, ah, I don't know about that one, Jesus. But he did it, didn't he? And that's what we have to do. We just have to know that we're hearing from God. It's the greatest thing that could happen to you is to be able to discern the voice of God for your life. You've got to know the word but you also know how to hear God's voice so you're getting directed in what the word is for your life in every situation, right? Yeah. That's why you're in a prophetic church. Amen. The reason that you'll do greater things than me is because I will send, go to the Father and ask him to send you the Holy Spirit who will remain constantly with you. Yeah. Oh, even if you're sinning, oh, even if you're in the middle of sinning, the Holy Spirit remains constantly with you. He's not happy about it, right? He wants, to, he wants to live in a holy vessel, but he doesn't abandon you just because you're sinning. Yeah, and thank God that he brings conviction to it. And anybody ever look at the word paraclete as one of the names of Holy Spirit, right? There's so many different ways that he gets a name, like helper. Helper doesn't quite fit the bill. And then attorney, some people think of him as an attorney. It's even more than that. And one of the things about the Passion Translation, Brian Simmons goes into the Aramaic, not just the Greek, but the Aramaic, and they're a little different. But Aramaic was the native tongue of Jesus. And there's a, a similar word in the Aramaic called paraclete. I'm just going to read you what one of the um, uh, comments, well, actually what Brian Simmons said. So the role of the Holy Spirit is to protect defend and save us from ourselves and our enemies. That's pretty good, right? So that's a little bit more than a lawyer. 
That's a little bit more than just a helper. <laughs> He's going to protect, defend, and save us from ourselves and our enemies, keep us whole, and keep us healed. So we pray to the Father in the name of the Son with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because you know what it's like to have a devotional time that feels very dry. Where you look through the first page of what you were supposed to read and your mind has drifted. Right? You want that word to explode off the page at you, don't you? Like you just had two extra large Starbucks with three shots of extra espresso in there. I'll give you heart palpitation. Imagine if you, when you read the word, it felt like that. Boom! Boom! Like it's just, well, did you ask the Holy Spirit to make the word come alive? So we pray to the Father in the name of the Son, but it's, the energy is coming from the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And this rest of this, so what, what Brian Simmons, the way he summarized what the Aramaic word for paraclete is, a redeemer who ends the curse. Woo! So you can look into that. I'll send you more if you want it, but I think we should just all lift a hand and say, Holy Spirit, be my Redeemer that ends the curse of sin in my life. I want to operate at full throttle in the things of the Lord. I want to see greater things happen through my life than what happened through Jesus because he said it's in his word. And I believe it. I believe it. So the Holy Spirit comes to end the work of the curse of sin in our lives and save us from every effect of that sin. Now here's another thing we need to know. John 14 and verse 17, it says, The world doesn't recognize the spirit of truth because it doesn't know the spirit and it's unable to receive him. But you do know the spirit. I do know the spirit. Say it. I do know the spirit. So this is how he talks to me sometimes. Yesterday, I was trying to find my keys. I couldn't remember where I put my keys down. Anybody ever done this? All right, you can all relate, right? And then I would just get all, I'm going to retrace my steps, blah, blah, blah. And then he's like, just sit down and listen. I'll tell you where they are. If you'll just sit down and listen, because I know where they are. But you're not listening. Stop running around and listen. And then it's even more embarrassing, because this morning, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the, you know, the service and if it's going to rain and break down and all. And I couldn't find the strap for my guitar. Now, I've been playing the guitar for 50 years, right? A crazy amount of time. You'd think I'd have an extra strap. Like, how hard is this? I have one strap. I'm looking all over. I had already put my guitar in where they were starting to rehearse. And the same thing, the Lord said, would you please stop? Go in and start playing the guitar. It was on the guitar. Like, that's embarrassing. That's embarrassing. And if you just ask him to begin with, he'll tell you. He knows where it all is. So, like, you can dial down the striving. You can dial down all this energy that we put into things. Just trust the relationship. And I'm only just being honest, right? It's like we just get ahead of ourselves. I know people that are looking for their glasses and the glasses are on top of their head, right? I won't go any further than that. There's a couple of other examples. I know the Spirit. Say that. I know the Spirit. And He speaks to me. And I know His voice. He's not going to tell me to sin. No, He's holy. He avoids sin in our lives. So thank you, Lord. And then when Jesus says in John 14, I will never abandon you like orphans because the Spirit's going to be in you. You've always got my presence wherever you go. Whether you choose to tap into that is completely up to you. That's a little scary, isn't it? And then he says in verse 27, I will leave the gift of peace with you. My peace. That's what Jesus said, my peace. Not the kind of fragile peace that the world gives, but my perfect peace. That's Isaiah, right? I will leave you in perfect peace when you keep your mind stayed on me. Thank you, Lord. You knew where my guitar strap was today. 
The little things matter to God. If it's important to you, it's important to Him. All right, don't yield to fear. This is the rest of verse 27. That's a word for today, huh? Don't yield to fear. Don't yield to fear or be troubled in your hearts. Instead, be courageous. I won't speak to you much longer, for the ruler of this dark world is coming. But he has no power over me, for he has nothing to use against me. Wow. Wouldn't you like to be able to say that? The ruler of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. And then the passion, he makes it look like a courtroom. There's no evidence against me. He has nothing to accuse me of. We can strive for that. I don't even like to say strive. We can aspire to be like Christ. That everything we do and say is only what we hear the Father do and say. Amen. That was his model for us. And then in verse 31 of John 14, he says, I'm doing exactly what the Father destined me to accomplish. I think by faith we should say it. I'm doing exactly what the Father destined me to accomplish. Now, you may not believe that, but say it by faith. And the more your spirit man hears you saying it, the more likely is the outcome. All right, so I only have two more portions, all from John 15. I'm coming down the home stretch now. Oh, Lord, thank you for Nate. Barnabas, I'm going to call him Barnabas. Ministry of Encouragement. This wasn't so bad today, was it? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The one B that was left just tried to get me. <laughs> all right, so you know this portion of scripture. It's all, I just love the passion and the voice. I've been going to those two a lot. The passion translation and the voice, all free, all online for free if you're looking for it. It says, I'm the true vine, and my father is the keeper of the vineyard. My father examines every branch in me. Who would that be? Us, right? Us. We're the branches in the vine. We abide in the vine of Jesus, right? He said, well, my father is examining every branch and he cuts away the ones that don't bear fruit. Now that could be an amen or an ouch. Amen. Thank you. Why would it be an ouch? Because the devil might have just gotten enough under my skin that I stopped bearing fruit. Now I think Jesus is even saying bearing good fruit, right? Because he said a bad tree can't bear good fruit and a good good tree can't bear bad fruit, right? So the Father's looking for good fruit from our lives. That might be encouraging your loved ones. That might be telling your wife you love her. That might be just making her feel safe. You know, that's, that's a good thing you can do. Men, for your wives, just make her feel safe. Security is an important thing. Wives, help your husband feel respected. That's something that he would want. We know this. It's right in the Word, Ephesians 5. You can read it. So that's something we can do. That's good fruit. Instead of screaming at your children, get down on a knee, look them in the eye, and say, if you do that again, I'll kill you. But say it kindly. <laughs> you can say it with a smile on your face. I brought you into the world. I can take you out. It's really easy. <laughs> I don't mean that. You know, it was a joke, right? <laughs> they need so much encouragement right now. The kids, they're struggling. Many of them are struggling with the online learning the parents are struggling, trying to do the work from home and help their children. We were talking to a teacher last night. She's saying how frustrating it is that the parents aren't even trying sometimes to help the kids at home. So look, this is a long time for them to be out of the regular classroom, right? So speak to that child. Tell them I'm praying for you. I pray that you'll be able to overcome the obstacle of online learning. It's very different, and it's not for everybody. Not everybody's wired for that thing. So he cuts away those that don't bear fruit. That's a sobering word. He leaves those that are bearing fruit, but for those people, he carefully prunes them. How many are bearing fruit, but you felt the cut of the pruning knife? <laughs> yeah, well, we're supposed to welcome that, even though it's a little painful. But the Lord might just say, I want you to, turn, I want you to put this thing down that you were doing. It was a good thing, but it was a good thing for last season, but we're in a new season now. So you don't want to try to put the new wine into that old wineskin. Anybody got an amen on that? Yeah. Not easy to do though, right? Because we got used to doing things a certain way. But he's saying, no, 
Even if you're already bearing fruit, I love you enough to keep the pruning process going so you'll be even more fruitful for the kingdom of God. And then he says, abide in me. Can you look at somebody and say, abide in him? He's the vine. You are the branch. Abide in the vine. Man, that's a good word, isn't it? If you do that, he said, I will abide in you. If you abide in me, I will abide in you. And then you can't bear fruit if you're disconnected from the branch, right? You've got to be abiding in the vine. And if you're not connected to me, you're going to be bearing bad fruit. It's my interpretation. All right, last four verses. John 15, 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you'll bear great fruit. Without me, you will accomplish nothing. And that's a Selah kind of scripture, isn't it? Without me, you'll accomplish nothing that will bear lasting fruit for the kingdom. You'll accomplish things. You'll get a lot done in the worldly sense. But he's pretty, pretty blunt here. If you want to produce fruit for the kingdom, you got to be abiding in the vine. It's a great picture, isn't it? Because as goes the root, so goes the fruit. So if our root is attached to Jesus, the fruit's going to be kingdom. God's kingdom in the earth. I think 20 years from now, when we look back on 2020, there's going to be things that we look at and say, if only I had realized the opportunity that I had. Yeah, I mean, we're getting by. Thank God we're prospering. We're here. We have a place to meet. Buildings paid off, all the construction. A lot of good things to be happy about. But I think the Lord is saying, press in a little deeper. Let's go a little farther. Who's in your contacts that needs a phone call of encouragement right now? That they're so, they're so hurting, they can't even think to call and tell you that they need them, that they need you to pray for them. Can you just lift your hand right now and say, Lord, show me that person. Show me those people in my contact list, in my sphere of influence that need me to reach out to them and just speak a word from you that it would be like that cup of cold water to that dry and thirsty soul. Lord, we pray you would pour your water through us that living water that you spoke to the woman at the Samaritan, that well. Let it be living water pouring out of us. I don't want to miss my day of visitation, right? I don't want to look back 20 years from now and say, oh my God, I had such an opportunity, but my eyes weren't open to what the Lord was trying to show me. We're not just here for ourselves. We're here to be ambassadors for the kingdom, amen? A little louder on the amen. <laughs> Verse 7, he says it again. He repeats himself again. I only got two more verses. 7 says, if you abide in me and my voice abides in you. That's the voice translation. If you abide in me and my voice abides in you. That's Holy Spirit. You open your mouth, he will fill your mouth. If you abide in me and I abide in you, your voice will speak what I want you to say. And then he says this real stretching verse. Ask anything ask anything and it will be given to you wow that's a faith stretching statement isn't it how many got faith to believe that verse that anything we ask will be given to us if we're abiding in him and his voice is abiding in us we can ask anything and it will come to pass for us wow that puts a pretty big pretty big list in front of us to be abiding in him Lord that that prodigal would return home that that neighbor would get saved that that marriage would be saved before the divorce happens that the child would stop doing drugs I'm abiding in you Lord I'm asking in your name I'm full of your spirit I'm listening and hearing your voice let it come to pass now no more delay Say it, would you? No more delay. Put your foot down. No more delay. All right, let's stand. We'll finish the last verse on our feet. I would really just like to thank the setup crew. Can we please give them a hand? It's a lot of work. A lot of work to get this all done. 
if you've got time and you can stick around at the end, men especially, we want to get it all packed up before if it does start to rain. But let's just focus on Jesus for one minute before we end, okay? We talked about the word curses earlier and just, you know, you can ask the Lord, is there anything about the way I see myself that is not the way you see me? Whatever things that were spoken over me, I thought I broke them, but if there's still any fruit about that, I want it off my life. I want this description that John has given here in in chapter 14, because this is how he ends it in verse 8. He says, your abundant growth and your faithfulness as my followers will bring glory to my Father. Wow. You need a life mission statement. There it is. Lord, glorify your name through us today. Could you lift your hands? Say it with me, Lord. Glorify your name through my life that I might bear much fruit for the kingdom and fruit that remains. And then just where we started, even if my heart condemns me, you are greater than my heart. Say that again. Even if my heart condemns me, you are greater than my heart. I receive your forgiveness. In any way I've fallen short. Please, Lord, rebuild my stamina. Rebuild my hope. My faith in you. And let me realize, <coughs> excuse me, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I just speak that over you, church, prophetically. On the eight-month anniversary of COVID, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The number eight is a new beginning. Old things are passing away, and we're coming into the new. A lot of that, a lot of what happens to us is based on the lens that we're looking through. And I'm just speaking it over you by faith that you're going to look through the lens of joy as you go out of this place today in Jesus' name. You all have an awesome week, and we'll let you know what we're doing for next week. Find a 